I'm Bernie Zinman. I'm a senior scientist at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute, Mount Sinai Hospital, and professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. I'm delighted to participate in this At the Limits conference in Canada, and uh, I'm particularly honored to deliver the Lancet Lecture. A hundred years of insulin, have we reached the limits? These are my disclosures with respect to uh, this presentation. So the objectives of my uh, presentation is to provide a historical perspective, perspective on the discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto. I also want to highlight some advances in insulin therapy and the continued challenges. Let's set the stage for the Toronto discovery. <clears throat> in 1869, Langerhans described irregular shaped islands of cells in the pancreas. These are called the islets of Langerhans. In 1890 on, Mehring, Minkowski, Gley, Zulser, Opie continued to make important advances characterizing what was called the internal secretion of the pancreas. 1919 on, Paulesco, Kleiner, have success in reducing glucosuria in dogs, but with inconsistent results and serious adverse reaction. There were no conclusive studies in people with type 1 diabetes. This is what McLeod's laboratory looked like at the University of Toronto uh, in May of 1921 when Banding and Best initiated their work. Leonard Thompson, uh, as many people know, was 14 and the first patient to receive insulin at the Toronto General Hospital. And this is Leonard Thompson's chart. And as you can see, he was admitted in December uh, of uh, 1921. Uh, first note says he's feeling well on admission, uh, drinking uh, fluid freely. Uh, he weighs only 65 pounds. Uh, all of a sudden, he's having more ketosis and uh, not feeling much better. And on January the 11th, 1922, 15 cc's of what was called McLeod serum, because it came from his laboratory, 7.5 cc's into each buttock was administered. And this uh, chart also describes the first adverse effects of insulin uh, injections, a subcutaneous reaction with a uh, uh, a seven and a half cc uh, diameter, uh, what sounds like an abscess over the buttock. Here we see Leonard Thompson's glucosuria chart, the way we measured uh, diabetes control in uh, patients uh, that are, are admitted to hospital, uh, is to measure glucosuria. And here you see uh, that uh, the first injection uh, on uh, January the 11th, uh, perhaps reduced glucosuria somewhat, but subsequently, uh, uh, January 22nd on, you see dramatic reductions in glucosuria from approximately 200 grams of glucose in the urine per day to less than 20. The second series of injections were a consequence of the preparation uh, prepared by call it. This uh, obvious uh, improvement and obvious th uh, clinical response uh, can be summarized as follows. The experiments conducted at the University of Toronto and Toronto General Hospital resulted in the first demonstration of a pancreatic extract that could be prepared that would consistently lower glucose, reverse ketosis, and arrest the catabolic effects of type 1 diabetes. This resulted in the remarkable rapid commercial production of insulin in 1922 and the awarding of the Nobel Prize in 1923. And here you see Banting at work in the laboratory around 1923. And one of the patients that uh, came to Toronto uh, from uh, the United States was uh, a young lad, Ted Ryder. And here we see him uh, before and after insulin. And this is 1922. Ted's uh, mother wrote to Banting, and Banting agreed to treat him. And you can see this uh, sort of emaciated young boy transformed to a chubby, healthy uh, uh, little guy in the picture on the right. Well, Ted Ryder did very well. And here you see him at age 75 
when he came up to Canada uh, uh, in the context of celebrating uh, the uh, 75th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, he was uh, the first person to be on insulin for 70 years and he died at age 77. This is what a vial of insulin looked like back then, produced by the Connaught Laboratories at the University of Toronto, and the entire vial contains 50 units. Concentration of insulin was 10 units per cc, that's five cc's. Of course, now we have 100 units per cc. Here you see uh, what the Nobel uh, Prize Award looks like. Uh, as you can see, it's awarded to Fred Banting and uh, John McLeod, uh, and uh, that created a great deal of controversy, as you can imagine. Uh, but there are only allowed three names on uh, a Nobel Prize. They decided to settle with Banting and McLeod. Banting shared his prize uh, money with uh, Best, and McLeod shared his prize money with uh, Collip. So let's hear more than just a single case. What was the uh, benefit of insulin uh, therapy? And uh, of course, uh, having been discovered in Toronto, the first 50 uh, patients were actually treated in Toronto. Uh, and this is a, a remarkable description, which I'd like to share with you. Up to the present time, over 50 cases of diabetes have been treated with insulin. Many of the patients have come to the hospital in a in the state of extreme undernutrition, suffering from great weakness, along with an indisposition to any physical activity. On the first or second day of treatment, if sufficient insulin is given, the urine becomes sugar-free, as you saw, and on the second or third day, ketone-free. These patients become conscious of increasing strength before the end of the first week. Hunger is replaced by appetite and the thirst is lessened. Edema, which is common in these cases, disappears. Patients find they are less irritable and state that they begin to sleep well. The expression improved, the skin becomes less harsh and dry, even the hair becomes softer. In fact, the patient loses that appearance which characterizes the diabetic. In 10 days, a very considerable amount of physical vigor is restored. And amazingly, some patients have even been able to uh, return to work. Clearly a resurrection and a dramatic uh, clinical response to a new therapy. So the insulin era was wonderful. Patients who uh, had a short life expectancy now lived uh, many decades. However, it soon became clear that this insulin era is also associated with long-term complications. Visual impairment and blindness, total of 30% occurred in people on insulin uh, with type 1 diabetes. Renal failure, 35% of, of individuals. Stroke, 10%. Amputation, 12%. Myocardial infarction, 25%. And mortality was increased two to six fold. And this is a description from the Steno Hospital, a major diabetes therapy hospital in Denmark. So people were puzzled, why did this occur? You know, people with diabetes look healthy, why, why are they getting these complications? And one of the uh, explanations was the imperfect correction of glucose, and that it was this high blood glucose that led to the complications, namely the glucose hypothesis. I was fortunate enough to be part of the original uh, DCCT, and we continue uh, to uh, study these patients. Uh, and the uh, glucose hypothesis stated treatment that normalized glucose levels will prevent or delay the long-term complications of diabetes. We had a primary prevention cohort and a secondary intervention cohort. Primary prevention was to see if you could stop the development of, of retinopathy. Secondary intervention to see if you can slow the progression. And indeed, uh, the study was stopped early and the results presented at the American Diabetes Association in uh, 1993 and published in the New England Journal at the same time. And the reason this study was uh, stopped early uh, was because of the dramatic benefits that were accruing. You can see retinopathy, either development, three-step progression, or severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy dramatically reduced. Nephropathy, microalbumin and albumin were uh, uh, reduced. And neuropathy, uh, by clinical assessment, was also a very significantly reduced. 
However, there's another issue to this diabetes control conundrum, namely hypoglycemia. On the left panel, you see the rates of severe hypoglycemia, coma, seizure, uh, requiring uh, external assistance is much higher in those on intensive therapy compared to conventional. During EDIC, everybody was on, uh, uh, was switched to uh, intensive therapy because that was clearly a change in the standard of care for patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see, the rates of hypoglycemia are still unacceptably high in both the original conventional group and the original intensive group. Now, McLeod and Campbell wrote in 1925, and using insulin would of course be ideal if it could be supplied so as to imitate the natural process. And that's what we do as endocrinologists. We always like to replace hormones and duplicate physiology. This is a tough task for insulin. As you can see here, the 24-hour uh, insulin profile is actually quite uh, dramatic with large increases in insulin occurring at the time of meal ingestion. Glucose is kept pretty constant, but there's a basal requirement of insulin 24 seven. And then when nutrients are taken in, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, a large secretion of insulin is required uh, from the pancreas. How do we duplicate this? And uh, in uh, 1989, I was asked to write a, a piece for the medical intelligence section of the New England Journal on the physiological replacement of insulin, and I indicated that this remained an elusive goal. But progress has been made. Here we see the timeline of insulin development. And you can see that first we were restricted uh, by animal insulins, and this is your peak uh, insulin from uh, bovine or uh, pork uh, sources, uh, and indeed there were uh, still uh, things that could be done to improve the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of insulin, making longer acting NPH and Lante series of insulin um, and uh, protamine zinc insulin. Uh, however, things took a leap uh, forward when semi-synthetic human insulin and recombinant DNA human insulin was produced thus relieving any concern about insulin supply from the source and also reducing the probability of insulin antibodies and uh, resistance that could develop. Uh, then we go on, of course, to develop uh, designer insulins, rapid acting insulin analogs, better basal replacements, and uh, this is a very active uh, field of uh, discovery. So let's talk about basal insulins. So basal insulins have to have certain characteristics. We need long duration. We want to control fasting blood glucose with at most one injection per day. Indeed, now there are basal insulins that can be given once a week. We want flat time action profile, low risk of hypoglycemia, nocturnal hypoglycemia. And as patients describe, we want less variability. Patients will tell you from day to day their response to the same dose of insulin seems to be variable. And can't you fix it, doc, so that this doesn't occur? What about meal insulins? Well, for meal insulins, as you saw, we need rapid absorbed insulin. And here you see the desired meal timeline and the normal free insulin levels that occur with meals. So we want to minimize postprandial glucose excursions because that contributes to overall control. We want to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia in the postprandial period. And uh, this continues to be a challenge, but good progress is being made. So what are those continued challenges? So the, despite 100 years of progress, can the subcutaneous injection of designer insulins truly duplicate physiologic secretion? I thought it was an elusive goal then. We're getting closer to that. Will it be necessary to achieve hepatic exposure to high portal insulin concentrations that are seen with physiological pancreatic insulin secretion? Hypoglycemia risk will always be a challenge for any open loop system. An improvement in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of insulin without a closed loop technologies are probably at the limits. 
the title of this symposium. There are exciting opportunities. We are on the threshold of developing an affordable, widely used closed loop artificial pancreas. The development of smart insulins whose biological activity is modulated by ambient glucose concentration would be uh, a dramatic leap forward. Injecting insulins whose biological action is modified by the prevailing glucose level. And there's continued research and development of tissue-specific insulin to enhance the hepatic activity to more closely approximate physiology. And for type 1 diabetes, we know this is an immunological disease. Can we develop immune interventions that can prevent the uh, development of type 1 diabetes in high-risk individuals? We have come a long way in 100 years Hopefully, the optimal replacement of insulin and or the prevention of type 1 diabetes will not take another 100 years. Before closing, I want to acknowledge uh, a colleague and friend uh, who passed away in 2017, Michael Bliss. He would have been so excited to take part in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. He, is, uh, contri he had contributed in a major way to medical history, particularly as it relates to the discovery of insulin and the players that are associated with that discovery. Thank you so much for your attention.